Merry Christmas, Valley View. We're so thrilled that you're tuning in with us online. It's going to be an amazing time together. Come on, let's celebrate the newborn king. Joy to the world, the Lord is come. Let earth receive her king. Let church family. Man, we are so excited that you are tuning in with us for this Christmas Eve service. For those of you that are online, man, we're stoked that you're joining us today with your family. Man, and, and one of our biggest hopes for you this season is that this season is full of good tidings, cheer, and awesome, awesome news for you. I, I don't know what it is about this season. Maybe you're different, but for me, this season is a season of happiness. It's a season of, of expectation. Maybe it's the fact that we have awesome things under the tree, or maybe it's the fact that we get to spend time with family, or, or maybe, just maybe, it's the fact that we get to celebrate our Savior's birth and coming into this world. Even though a lot of people aren't able to meet uh, right now in person for this time of the year, uh, we're so blessed here at Valley View to be at a church that, that is allowing us to gather in person and spend some time in community together. 
uh, just remembering the birth of our Savior. Tonight, we just want you to relax. For the next hour, we invite you to, to lay down aside whatever is worrying you, to lay down aside anything that's, that's in your head and spend the next couple minutes just remembering our Savior, Jesus Christ, and enjoying what we've prepared for you. So, so lean in, get some hot chocolate or some coffee, whatever you're sipping on, relax, and enjoy this Christmas service that we have for you. Let me pray for us. Father God, thank you, Lord, for this, for this awesome, awesome time of the year, Lord. This time when we get to celebrate the birth of your son and remember that. Father, I pray for every single person that is tuning in, that is, that is here. And I just pray, Lord, that this season would be a season of joy and of family and of love and of celebration. Father, thank you for Jesus and his sacrifice. And may you remind us every day of our lives whose we are and who we are. Jesus, I pray. Amen. Let's worship, church.
In those days, Caesar Augustus issued a decree that a census should be taken of the entire Roman world. This was the first census that took place while Quirinius was the governor of Syria. And everyone went to their own town to register. So Joseph went up from the town of Nazareth to Galilee to Judea, to Bethlehem, the town of David, because he belonged to the house and the line of David. He went there to register with Mary, who was pledged to be married to him and was expecting a child. And while they were there, the time came for the baby to be born. And she gave birth to her firstborn, a son. She wrapped him in cloths and placed him in a manger. And because there was no guest room available for them. And there were shepherds living in the fields nearby, watching over their flocks at night. An angel appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid. I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all people. Today, in the town of David, a Saviour has been born to you, and He is a Messiah, the Lord. This will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. Suddenly, a great company of heavenly hosts appeared with the angel, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest heaven and on earth, peace to those on whom His favour rests. When the angels had left them and gone into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let's go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has told us about. So they hurried off and found Mary and Joseph and the baby who was lying in the manger. When they had seen him, they spread the word concerning what had been told them about this child, and all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds said to them. But Mary treasured up all these things and pondered them in her heart. The shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all the things they had heard and seen, which were just as they had been told. On the eighth day, when it was time to circumcise the child, he was named Jesus, the name the angel had given him before he was conceived. Hasn't this been a year like any other year? And that year that we've all gone through is translated even into our Christmases because this is a Christmas unlike any other Christmas. We're giving presents in ways that we've never given presents before. We're dealing with all types of unprecedented change. Some of us are staying instead of traveling. Some are traveling instead of staying. And I don't know if you're aware of this, but there's even been a Christmas tree shortage this year. And so those that would have normally put a real tree in their home have had to settle for an artificial tree instead because of wildfires, because of the pandemic, because of trees just not being planted over the last few years. They aren't available this year. And all of that translates into change, change, change. But it's in times of great change like what we're dealing with now that we need to remember the one who doesn't change. The one who is the Alpha, the Omega, the beginning, the end, the first, the last, the everlasting God of ours. This God who has also given us a Christmas story that will never change as well. Maybe it's a story that some of you are very familiar with. Or maybe it's a story that you've never heard before. Whatever the case, it's a story that we need to be reminded of every year. Because it's in this story that we see how much God loves us and we come to know the real Jesus. Let's pick up in Luke chapter 2 and we'll start reading in verse 1. In those days, Caesar Augustus issued a decree that a census should be taken of the entire Roman world. This was not the first census that took place while Quirinius was governor of Syria. And everyone went to their own town to register. So Joseph also went up from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea, to Bethlehem, the town of David, because he belonged to the house and line of David. He went there to register with Mary, who was pledged to be married to him and was expecting a child. While they were there, the time came for the baby to be born, and she gave birth to her firstborn, a son. She wrapped him in clothes and placed him in a manger. 
And it's here that we read the end of the great journey that Mary and Joseph have been on in the lead up to Jesus' birth. And it's been quite a journey for them because obviously she became pregnant out of wedlock. Joseph had to sort through that and decided to reconcile their relationship. They undoubtedly dealt with some familial and society pressures against them. They probably dealt with some ostr- being ostracized somewhat as well. But that journey is over with. They made it to Nazareth. Jesus has been born. And things are beginning to settle down. Things are beginning to become manageable. At least as manageable as they can with a new infant baby. But it's a scene in which there is finally peace in their home. And what I've come to find is that for many of us, that this is the Jesus that we really love. The Jesus who is very manageable, who might want a little bit from us. I mean, certainly every baby wants some want, has some wants. But as it relates to this child, we're willing to invite him into our life. We're comfortable with him being a part of our life because we can still live the life that we want to live. You know, it reminds me of a movie that came out a few years ago. If you haven't seen this movie, I want to encourage you to check it out as soon as you can. It's entitled Talladega Nights, and it stars the actor Will Ferrell. A little ways into this movie, there's a prayer that is prayed. And it's an incredible prayer. It's an unbelievable prayer. And Ricky Bobby, he is a talented driver, but he's not all that bright. And I want to read some of the prayer to you that Ricky Bobby prays. And there's a great point that we need to learn that he teaches us from this dinner table that he's praying at. This is how he prays. Check this out. He's praying to a baby, Jesus. Dear Lord, baby Jesus, or as our brothers to the south call you, Jesus, we thank you so much for this bountiful harvest of Domino's, KFC, and the always delicious Taco Bell. I just want to take time to say thank you for my family. My two beautiful, beautiful, handsome, striking sons, Walker and Texas Ranger, or TR as we call them, call him. And it's in the midst of this prayer that he is getting interrupted by family members of his, of his who are telling him, Ricky Bobby, you got to quit praying to a baby Jesus. But he continues on, dear tiny Jesus, in your golden fleece diapers with your tiny little fat balled up fist, dear eight pound, six ounce newborn infant Jesus, don't you even know a word, don't even know a word yet, just a little infant and so cuddly, but still omnipotent. We just thank you for all the races that I've won in the $21.2 million. Woo! Thank you for all your power and your grace, dear baby God. I mean, what a prayer that he prays there. It's really incredible. And we have a a tendency to do what it is that Ricky Bobby did here. Because again, as the prayer is being prayed, he is getting interrupted by family members of his who are saying, he's not a baby anymore. He grew up. And then Ricky Bobby responds with, well, if you want to pray to the grown-up Jesus, you can, or the teenage Jesus, or the bearded Jesus, you can pray to that Jesus. But I'm comfortable with praying to the baby Jesus, because he is more manageable to me. And we all have a tendency to replace the real Jesus with the Jesus that we want, with the bailout Jesus. He's the Jesus that we run to when we need a bailout. When we don't have anyone else to go to, when there isn't another book to read, there isn't a a check to write, when we're out of options and we go to him to bail us out, or there's the part-time Jesus. And this is the Jesus that we go to when it's comfortable, when it's convenient. You see, the thing I found with part-time um, employees, or even when I worked a part-time job, is that I wanted to keep my full-time life. I just did that job to make a little bit of money because I had a little bit of a need. And so I would work it into my full-time life, but it was still a part-time job. And often we do the same thing with Jesus. We'll work him in during Christmas, we'll work him in at Easter, and maybe one or two other times during the year. But, but besides those particular instances, we've still got this full-time life that we really don't want him to have much say in. And then there's the storybook Jesus. He's a Jesus that we love reading about in the books. I mean, there's some wonderful translations that we have available to us that we can read ourselves or even read with our children. But we don't let that Jesus get off of those pages into our lives. And then that brings us back to, well, the baby Jesus. 
And he's the Jesus that, again, we're pretty comfortable with. And he might have some wants and a wants from us, but we're okay with those because we also know that we're going to be able to live quite a bit of our life the way that we want to live our life. But here's the thing that we have to understand is that coming to know the real Jesus is the most important decision anyone can make. And if we're settling for a counterfeit Jesus, then the person that God wants us to become, the difference that God wants to make in our lives, the difference that God wants to make through us in the world, it won't happen. It can't happen. But when, but when we are able to get Jesus right, there is a change that takes place. There's a change that can take place in our hearts, in our minds, in our souls. We become a different kind of person. And it's when Peter met the real Jesus that he was changed. It's when the, John, the apostle, met the real Jesus that he was changed. It's when Martha and Mary met the real Jesus that they were changed. It's when Philip Holland me met the real Jesus that I was changed you see I came to faith just late enough that I was asking some pretty serious questions about life and unfortunately I'd come to some conclusions that weren't necessarily accurate and when it comes to your view of God and Jesus specifically, it affects the way you live your life. I had someone in my life who, who knew me fairly well, well enough to be able to see some things that they were somewhat concerned about. This person believed in Jesus. I did not. I was 22 years old at the time. They asked me a series of different questions one day when they came to me with these concerns. I can't remember precisely what was all asked other than this one question. So what do you think, who do you think Jesus really was? And I said, well, I think he, he was a good guy. Ah, you know, he had some good things to say. Ah, I don't know. He's made a difference in a lot of people's lives. But I just don't know about this whole savior of the world thing. I'm not so sure about this son of God part that so many people believe in. And even as I was saying those answers with confidence, I knew they were insufficient. I knew they were inadequate. I knew that they probably weren't even right. And it was there that my journey really began to take off. And I began to pursue who this real Jesus really was, who he is, and who is to come. And it was through that journey that my life was changed. And what I've come to find is that the struggles that I had with the real Jesus are some of the struggles that others have had with the real Jesus, that maybe even you have with Jesus, that people in the first century had with Jesus as well. As I said, one of Jesus' followers was a man named John. He wrote the Gospel of John. Now, most scholars believe that he wrote that Gospel with a full understanding of what the other three Gospels had to say, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. And so John writes his Gospel in a very complimentary fashion. There are some stories that are repeated, but by and large, it's it's content that was not produced in those first three Gospels because John is wanting to offer a picture of Jesus that they didn't quite capture in their rendition of Jesus' story of their particular Gospel. And so John writes this Gospel, but unfortunately, people misinterpret it. They misunderstand it. And as a result of that, they start to teach that Jesus just came in spirit. He was divine, but they reject the claim that he was fully man as well. And you may ask, well, what difference does that make? Well, it makes quite a bit of difference, especially as it pertains to the way you live your life. Because for them, the way they understood it in this particular time is that if Jesus just came in spirit, then 
they could eat the food that they wanted to eat, food that had been sacrificed to pagans. They could participate in religious festivals towards the emperor and even towards these other gods, and it really wouldn't matter because they weren't worshiping them truly. They were just participating in the festival. And whatever they did there was really of no consequence because their bodies didn't matter. When it came to, in this particular day, sexual immorality, again, that wasn't a big deal because the body just wasn't important. And so John, realizing this, this misinterpretation of his gospel that is beginning to spread, steps in and he writes the letter of 1 John. And one of the primary reasons that he writes this letter is to communicate to people that Jesus was indeed fully God, but he was also fully man. And being fully man, that ought to affect the way that we live our lives. And that's why he opens his gospel this way, or his response to the misinterpretation of his gospel. In 1 John chapter 1, verse 1, that which, we, that which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes. And so notice the sense language that he is emphasizing here. See and touch which we have looked at and our hands have touched. This we proclaim concerning the word of life. The life appeared. It was born. He was born. Jesus, he physically came into this world. We have seen it and testified to it. And we proclaim to you the eternal life which was with the Father and, was, and has appeared to us. We proclaim to you what we have seen and heard. You can't, you can't, uh, they, they, these are things that don't take place with the Spirit. Spirit, so that you also may have fellowship with us. And this is why it's so important that we get the real Jesus right. He's connecting it to the fellowship that we have with one another. And our fellowship is with the Father and with His Son, Jesus Christ. We write this to make our joy complete. He connects you embracing the real Jesus with fellowship that you can have with others and with God. Apart from embracing the real Jesus, that fellowship with God and others can't take place the way that God desires for it to take place. But when we get it right, but when we embrace the real Jesus, and we don't settle for a part-time Jesus, a bailout Jesus, a storybook Jesus, or a baby Jesus. But we grab a hold of the real Jesus, the one who was fully God and fully man. Changes take place in people's lives. Things take place that are truly supernatural, that don't make any sense apart from him. Apart from him. One of my favorite Christmas stories is from some years ago in 1914. It's what's known as the Christmas Truce. It's in the middle of the Great War, World War I. In the country of Belgium, the British and the Germans are at each other's necks. And what's taking place is what's known as trench warfare. And they would dig out these deep trenches, and from there they would shoot at one another, attempting to take the other's lives. And so these trenches were full of mud and blood. But at about Chris, on Christmas Eve, there came a point in the middle of this battle that the two stopped shooting at one another. It was really just a break, truthfully, until they started their fighting again, until they developed a new plan. But the British soldiers noticed something going on over in the German troops. It seemed as though they were celebrating Christmas. And on top of the trenches, the German soldiers placed... Christmas trees, small ones that they had been able to find. And they decorated them with different types of decorations and ribbons. And then the British soldiers heard singing. And they didn't recognize the words, but they did recognize the melody. They were singing Silent Night. And as the German soldiers continued to sing, the British soldiers joined them. Silent night, holy night, all is calm, all is bright. Round yon virgin 
Mother and child, holy infant so tender and mild. And then when the song concluded, someone cried out, We won't shoot if you don't shoot. The other side said, okay. And then a brave soldier climbed out of that trench and began to walk in what is known as no man's land. It's a place that nobody goes to unless you're ready to die in the middle of war. But it was there that soldier after soldier climbed out of the trenches and met on both sides. They exchanged greetings. Merry Christmas is to one another. They even exchanged gifts on this Christmas Eve. Gifts of chocolate, mittens, and gloves. Things that would help them with the difficult conditions that they were dealing with in this particular country. Then Christmas came the next day, but the battle didn't start. At least not the battle like they had been accustomed to. One of the British soldiers actually had a soccer ball. Somehow, some way, it was there, and he pulled it out, and there was a soccer match between the British soldiers and the German troops. The Germans won three to two. But like all days, sadly, that day had to come to an end. And then they scurried back to their trenches where the war would have to begin again. But many soldiers would survive that battle and tell that story. Almost 80 years later, a group of soldiers returned to that place again from both sides. And it's there that they didn't just put a stone. It's there that they didn't just leave some random landmark. It's there that they put a cross. Because that experience that they had on that field was something that was only possible because of the real Jesus. And on that cross, they wrote the Christmas truce, the khaki chums, because they wore khakis as they played in that soccer match. And then below it, they wrote, lest we forget. Because they never wanted to forget what took place on that field, the peace that Jesus brought. In Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6, this story brings a whole new meaning to these words. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. And this, this is the real Jesus who we get to worship. This is the real Jesus who can change our lives. And I just have to ask you, do you know the real Jesus? Have you met him? Are you following him? Do you believe in him? The real Jesus who touches the untouchable, who cured the incurable, who, who cleansed the uncleansable. The one who went to the leper and healed him. Who went to the blind and gave them their sight back. Who went to the lame and lifted them up. Do you know this Jesus? He is the Jesus that Pilate wanted to get away from. The Pharisees wanted nothing to do with. The grave tried to hold down. But his love was too strong. His love was too steadfast. His love was too sincere. He was the one who had come to save the world because God loved us just that much. And you may come into this place. You may come into this message a little bit burdened, a little bit worn out. But the real Jesus' burden is light and his yoke is easy. And you may look at your life and think that you have no purpose at all to it. You may look into your life and wonder, is there any way that God can make anything come of all of this? Well, the Bible says that God works all things for the good of those who love him and are called according to his purpose. And you may look at the things that you have done in your life and you may say, Phil, you don't realize what I have done. And to that I respond, you don't realize what it is that he has done. And you might say, Phil, you don't understand what it is that I think about him. I have thought about him. And to that I respond, then you don't know what it is that he thinks about you. 
And you may look into your life and just wonder, I don't think there's any way for me to connect with God. And to that I say, there's nothing that can separate you from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus. The real Jesus who came into this world, who lived a perfect life, who did things that no one was willing to do, but he was willing to do. And he died for you. And he was thinking about you on that cross and he was offering forgiveness to those who had hurt him from that cross. And it's there that so many who had questions about him came and they took Jesus. Nicodemus came to Pilate and he asked for Jesus' body. He just wanted Jesus. He could have come to him and asked for so many different things. He was an influencer. He was a leader in the Jewish community. But he comes and he only wants the real Jesus. And it's there that he goes to Golgotha and he takes Jesus' body. And he puts it into a tomb. A tomb that wanted to hold him down. But it was a tomb that could never hold him down. Because he was fully man but he was also fully God and he conquered the grave in that. And in that one instance, he offered to all of us a past that could be forgiven, a purpose in this life for living and ultimately a place in heaven. And I want to invite you now, if you have yet to embrace the real Jesus, the wonderful counselor, the mighty God, the Prince of Peace, into your heart, into your life. I want to invite you to do that just now. I want to encourage you to make a profession of faith now. If you are watching on Facebook, you can click on the links that we've made available there and just say, I'm ready to accept Jesus as my Savior. You can click on the links that we've made available to you on our website, and you can let us know that you have accepted Jesus as your Savior and we will follow up with you. But if you are ready to make that decision, I want to pray with you now to embrace the real Jesus. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we are sinners. We've fallen short of your glory. But where we are hopeless, Father, you have given us hope. And for those who are listening, who are ready to call on your name, Lord, I pray that they would do that now because you have given us no other name under heaven by which we can be saved. And so, Father, may those individuals now just say, save me, Lord, save me. Do for me what only you can do for me. Give me purpose. Give me hope. Forgive me. Connect with me, Lord. Show me the way that is everlasting. And, Father, we thank you for those that are ready to make that confession, that have made that confession, Father. And we give you this in Jesus Christ's name. Amen.
can feel your angels all around I am resting underneath the shelter of your mighty wings your promises are where my hope is from When the whole world is crashing down, I fall to my knees and breathe in your peace. I the God who's never far so I will not be afraid God you always keep me safe in your arms I remember the God who's never fired, and I will not be afraid, God you'll always, you'll always keep me safe, oh you give me peace, hope. When the whole world is crashing down, I fall to my knees and breathe in, and breathe in, and breathe in your peace. We thank you for being with us online, checking us out for this Christmas Eve. And we want to wish you a very, very Merry Christmas. We also want to encourage you to continue to be faithful in your generosity in this time. As we consider how much God has given us in his son, this is an opportunity for us to give back to him in the name of Jesus, to truly give a special gift to Jesus. We want you to be aware of our Christmas offering. That's a, that's a fund that will help to fund so many outreach projects in our community, then which we are going to truly be a blessing to our community through 2021. It's also an opportunity for us to continue to uh, take care of our facility here on site, to continue to be able to provide quality um, online streaming like we have been. All of these funds go to different uh, projects that we have coming up, different initiatives that we have coming up. And we just want to thank you so much for your generosity that's helped us to get to where we are. And it is through your generosity that we will not just stay here, but we will come through it. We will come through all of this and continue to be the church that God is calling us to be as we're helping families follow Jesus in our community. We thank you for being with us this Christmas. We hope you have a very, very Merry Christmas, and we will see you again soon. Some people like diamond rents. Some people want snow. Some people want everything tied and strange. Single thing for my little.
Took me by the hand, brought me in from the 